Hello, and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. My name is Ashley Giordano, and I'm senior editor at Overland Journal and Expedition Portal. And we're here at Overland Expo West in Flagstaff, Arizona, in our Black Series podcast trailer extraordinaire. And I'm here with two special guests today, Mac and Owen from Bound for Nowhere. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much, Ashley. This is such a treat. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, anytime. And special thanks to the New England Overland Rally for supporting this week's podcast. The New England Overland Rally will bring together overlanders, adventure travelers, outdoor enthusiasts, and specialty exhibitors from throughout the Northeast and further for a fun and informative weekend of camping, educational classes, vendor demos, live music, and even culinary creations. Thompson Speedway Motorsports Park, located in the quiet northeast corner of Connecticut, is within an hour of several major cities, including Boston, Hartford, and Providence. The New England Overland Rally will be one of the largest gatherings of overland and outdoor enthusiasts in the Northeast. And the fall is a wonderful time of year at the track, and they have more than 200 acres for camping, vendor displays, food and beverage areas, and parking. For more information and to register, please visit neoverlandrally.com. Um, you guys have done extensive vehicle travel through North America and Mexico. And uh, yeah, it seems like you've learned a lot about vehicles and the creative process and probably each other and yourselves along the way. So um, yeah, I'm wondering, like, how did you guys get into this? I feel like our story kind of starts a lot longer ago than the version that I guess we are talking about now. Um, Owen and I, post-college, I think that it was two weeks after I graduated from college, uh, we just kind of took our savings account and my Honda Element and hand-me-down tent for my parents, and we just kind of hit the road. It was greatly inspired by something that my parents did after college. And um, when Owen and I started dating, it was an idea that he had always been really intrigued by. And so he was just like, we should do that. And I'm always game for anything like that. So we just decided, so we took our meager amount of savings And we got on the road and we were able to travel for about six months with that money. And our objective, it was only like six grand. So we really didn't have very much to take with us. But we did the most, we ate a lot of canned chilies and things like that. (laughs) But we we just wanted to go for as long and as far as we could. Um, I am an army brat and had lived outside of the United States for most of my life. And Owen is born and raised in the Southeast. Yeah. So I hadn't had a chance to see much of the country at all so it was a nice it was a nice opportunity for us to you know shop for a new place to live that was sort of the objective okay yeah looking for the place yes this was in 2008 so the economy was it was 2012 oh yeah well big difference (laughs) (laughs) yeah 2012 um but yeah the economy wasn't doing super well uh we were fresh out of art school and people weren't hiring artists to and particularly not moving them across the country. And so we kind of realized over the course of that six months that we actually fell in love with the movement more so than one particular place. Cause I think that we're also huge suckers for falling in love with everywhere. Cause everywhere has something really special and unique and interesting to offer, but we just really wanted the movement more so than anything else. So that was kind of the inspiration for this 2.0 version that we're doing now. Right. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time just getting ourselves prepared for this new version. So that's just like setting up our careers so that we could work freelance remotely and then bop around indefinitely. Nice. So when you finished up that trip, what happened after that did you start looking for a vehicle were you trying to set up to work on the road How did no that so that was so we just ran we actually ran out of money in Colorado and Owen's family were in Atlanta and we had just enough money to get back to Atlanta and so we kind of raced back and it felt like maybe two weeks later you had a, a desk job you're working in a studio is that right yeah uh it just to go back a little bit we were in Denver Colorado on that trip and our friend was cat sitting the entire time. And he called us and said that the cats had fleas and that his entire house now had fleas. And he was panicking. He so had no much. idea what to do about it. So at that point, we were so low on money. We were just like, all right, screw it. Let's just drive all the way back to Atlanta. And then, yeah, we took care of the fleas, luckily. And then uh, 
yeah, I fell into a job pretty quickly just because I had been working before we left in Atlanta. And so it was just kind of an easy segue back into normal life. And then, you know, a few years later, we had bought in a house in Atlanta. We were like kind of settling in and then all of a sudden we started panicking. <laughs> yeah. So we, we bought a, it was one night. So we both had, we were both working in a studio at that point and we were both taking on additional freelance work and we were moonlighting, um, just doing that at night. And I think it was like 1130 at night one night we were doing work on top of our studio work and we both looked at each other and we we're like, what? is going on like this is not how we envisioned our lives you know we love this house but this is just not what we pictured for ourselves at all and so that night we actually kind of sat down and made a plan and we put a date on the calendar two and a half years in the future and we left on that day wow yeah on that day we left on that day that's awesome april 19th 2016 yeah it sounds like you were pretty young at that point yeah we were yeah yeah i think that the thing is, like, once you realize what you love, it kind of feels like it puts everything into perspective. You're willing to do anything it takes to make that possible. And we realized that our jobs weren't actively going to be something that was going to help us live on the road. So we needed to put a date far enough out that would give us the opportunity to reformat our careers to be able to take with us. And so that was kind of the biggest thing that we needed to prepare. And then the other thing was obviously we didn't have a vehicle at the time and the Honda Element, unfortunately, was not going to cut it uh, for full time travel. So we just wanted to make sure that we had plenty of time to make that transition um, and to do all of the prep work. And that was the hardest two and a half years probably of my life um, to know that you want something and to see it in the future and to just I would sit in the driver's seat of my car in my office and I would hold onto the steering wheel and I would just be like, well, what if I just kept driving? What if I didn't stop until I got to the Grand Canyon? And it, it was just, it took everything I had to go into that, into that job. But I think it instilled a sense of tenacity to fight for what we want. And patience. Yeah. I'm sure. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely. Nice. So what steps did you take in order to prepare to, to transition, to be able to work on the road during those years? Yeah, so I think that I stayed in that job for just over two years when we got back. And then when we made that plan, I actively started trying to take on more and more work at night so that I could eventually quit my day job. And then I could start freelancing. And I guess essentially we were trying to groom our clients from that point on, just like we went ahead and told them what the plan was. And I think that most of them were like, yeah, yeah, sure, whatever and they didn't really think it was actually gonna happen. And yeah, just we spent a few years just trying to build up that client base and like warn them ahead of time that we were gonna be remote. And luckily both of us kind of stumbled into jobs that were remote friendly well before COVID. So yeah, it's it was just kind of training these clients and just letting them know that we were gonna be gone, but also building up that business in the meantime to make sure that we'd be sustainable. Yeah, it was. it's kind of weird to have to fold your clients into what your personal life looks like. It's like, just so you guys know, we're gonna be moving into our car, we're gonna be traveling around, but don't worry, we'll still be here for you, we'll still get your work done. And I think that as silly and ridiculous as that was, it's instilled a sense of community in us with our clients because whenever we chat with them, they're like, where are you? What have you been doing? What have you been seeing? And I think that because there's more of a bond between us and our clients, our business has grown exponentially since we've gotten on the road because there's a personal aspect to working with us. And I think that people enjoy that. And then they pass us on to other people who need the type of work that we do. Right. So yeah, it's been, it's been a really lovely process. And then we get to go visit them too, because most of them were not in Atlanta, which is where we left from. Um, so it's kind of cool that we get to catch up with all these people that we work with throughout the year and then to be able to see them in their home turf. That's so cool. What type of work were you guys are, I guess, just explain what kind of work you were, are doing if it's the same now. Yeah, you should definitely go okay. first. <laughs> Mine, mine's shorter. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Uh, I do motion graphics and so we were doing a bunch of stuff for TV and small startups in Atlanta. There's a big broadcast scene there, so we were doing TV show titles, in credits, lower thirds, things like that. And so that just 
luckily segues into, you know, like things like explainer videos, illustration is also involved in design in general. So I have like these three kind of things that I like to do and live in. Nice. Yeah. So I left behind, I was doing uh, apparel branding. So I would uh, design uh, textile graphics that would get, and they would end up on graphic, or excuse me, they'd end up on apparel. Um, and that isn't something that is really easy to take with you. So I was just transitioning more into like packaging, graphic design and illustration. Um, but that wasn't ever really my passion. It was just something that I was doing so I could transition into full-time freelance work because, you know, pre-COVID world, you had to have something that was very specific to being freelance. And luckily, you know, that there's so many more options for people now. Um, but since then, my work has transitioned greatly um, into just photography and filmmaking. Nice. Yeah. And does did that come out of your schooling or did you kind of pivot to something that was a little bit different? So my degree is not at all what I'm doing. So my degree is in printmaking. So I have a fine art degree um, and I am not currently or actively making fine art anymore. But I think that when you go, so we went to, we met. We met in college. We went to art school together. We were on the swim team, which is where we met. But um, I think that if you're trained in art and design, you can take that eye with you to anything that you do. And I feel like that was actually a really empowering aspect of going to art school is just realizing what a collaborative environment looks like. And you don't necessarily have to have all the skill sets to do something. As long as you can surround yourself by the right people, you can make anything that you want to make, um, which has greatly led me to photography and filmmaking yeah you had a good background in photography and all that stuff well, hey, so thanks. it was a nice <laughs> transition easy uh i i did study motion graphics so yeah my schooling was in fact what i do now <laughs> nice so you guys were on this path to taking jobs on the road and making that transition and uh you also had the vehicle to decide on so how did that process go uh, we're hopeless romantics, um, and so naturally a Volkswagen Vanagon was going to be our first rig. I had always wanted one, and in fact, when we were on the road uh, that first time, we met a guy in the Badlands who had this adorable, like, rusty orange Volkswagen Vanagon, and we hunkered down for a storm, and we hung out and had dinner and a couple beers with him, and we we're like, oh, this is it. Like, if we ever do this again, like, this is the rig. And I will say from a livable standpoint, there's no better interior layout in my opinion than a Volkswagen Vanagon uh like with the full camper interior um so that's what we started with like almost immediately I believe that night that we put the date on the calendar I was just like oh look at all these Vanagons for sale I guess this is just like what we're gonna do and that did end up being yeah what we did we paid for it like we bought it and then we went to go pick it up and it wouldn't start which was a Huge sign for things to come. <laughs> it was a huge red flag that we clearly ignored. Yeah, a lot of foreshadowing there. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm sure you're not the only one. Right. <laughs> no, there. Yeah, you got a good community of support. Yeah, I'm sure. Definitely. So we, um, it was fully stock when we bought it, um, and we did the best we could to make it as reliable as humanly possible before we got on the road because we were fully aware of the fact that it was not reliable. For instance, uh, Owen wouldn't let me drive it to work until it started for 20 consecutive times with no issue, and I was able to drive it to work like three times. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great car to like shove your life into and travel the country with. Um, but yeah, so we, we did a lot of work to it. We did a Subaru swap. We did a bunch of transmission work, a bunch of rewiring. So we took about, I think we had it for over, over six months before we hit the road to do as much work to it as humanly possible. Yeah, I think we actually had it for over a year before. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, because we ended up sending it out to Colorado to get all this work done, and then we flew out there and did, like, a test drive back, and I th think that that it went, went well. Yeah, I think it w went without a hitch, so we were like, oh, yeah, this is great. It's going to work for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we broke down within two weeks of being on the road full time. Yeah, so was it the, didn't last long. Was the vision that you had of living on the road what the reality was? So that, that, I feel like that's a, that's an interesting question. Cause there, it's kind of a loaded question. Um, I feel like, cause people always asked, was a huge transition to get on the road? And the answer is no, for sure. Because we had wanted it so bad for so long that it just kind of felt like a sense of relief once we finally made it happen. 
But um, I think that we were a little, it was a little jarring for our van to only make it to Vegas before it broke down for the first time. We actually broke down outside of the Hoover Dam. Uh, I think our fuel pump went into vapor lock because it was so hot. Um, so yeah, it was a little jarring to get on the road. Oh, and we were also broken into in Miami in the first two weeks. Yeah, I think um, the honeymoon period, like we really didn't have one because immediately we went into like the sobering reality. Um, we started in Orlando. Um, we drove down to Miami in the Keys and then we stopped in Miami on the way back. So yeah, like a week into it, someone broke our window and stole some food out of our fridge and a bunch of like diving they, gear. And they bled all over our van. It was, yeah, it's oh, pretty no. in, invasive. And yeah, I think that pretty, yeah, sobering, as you said, to get on the road and immediately have a break in like that. And we had a safe, luckily, that had our camera and computer equipment because we probably would not be on the road today if that stuff was gone because it would have been such a financial hit right away that we probably would have it probably would have stopped us dead in our tracks yeah we it was just this weird little triangle window up in the front of the van and a storm was coming and we were driving all the way back to orlando so we put like a trash bag like out in that corner and just booked it as fast as we could to orlando just to try and get into a garage or someplace dry before it just got totally soaked it's so hard when that happens to you feel violated like it's very you know, violent yeah your house has been broken into mm -hmm. uh, it's the similar yeah. obviously and the weird vibe and feeling comfortable in it and yeah yeah, yeah. so I, we definitely there was no grace period for us to so reality hit kind of hard but i think that as much as that stuff was a bummer we were also just so elated to be doing what we had worked so hard for. So we kind of just, we just pressed on. We just took, took the punches and mm -hmm. tr did our best to recover and kept moving. And I think the interesting thing is too, that no matter, no matter the fact that we're the same people in each of these vehicles we've done, it's each vehicle has also like had a very different experience and a very different lifestyle comes with it. So with our van again, it was a lot of stress and anxiety about the mechanics of the vehicle itself. And then we traveled a lot in our Tacoma and that was really just more focused on us and what we were doing. And then in this newest version with the four wheel camper, it's sort of like this, uh, it feels more like our regular life almost back at home because we're getting to do like work and career stuff as well as traveling and all that stuff because yeah, like the Tacoma didn't really offer us a workspace. We were just like sleeping in a coffin in the back. Right. What have you learned from that progression of vehicles? I think that the biggest takeaway is that these, per like, even though these vehicles are very much a part of our team, they all have names. We care about them and we love them. But the thing is, at the end of the day, if it's not helping us towards our end goal, it's nothing personal. Like we just need to, we've, we're just so dedicated to doing everything that we do to the best of our ability. And if a rig is not assisting in that process, we just have to move on. We just have to, we just have to do better because at the end of the day, this trip is, this journey is about us. It's not about, a, it's not about a vehicle. So it was always just hyper-focused on what was going to be best for us and our needs at the time. And so the progression has just been tailoring and trying to figure out what that is. Can you take me through the vehicle, like, builds? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it was a 1985 Volkswagen van again. Mm -hmm. And then we realized that we really wanted 4x4 four four because a lot of the stuff that, you know, all of the recreational activities that we love to do are usually down really challenging roads. So we were like, oh, we just are hopeless romantics for these old rigs. So we ended up with a 1985 uh, Toyota Sun Um Apparently there was only, like, 21 of them ever made. And we somehow ended up with one fully original, but we wanted to do a little bit of updating to be able to house our work. And that took about nine months. And then we were in it for two weeks, I think, is all we made it. Oh. And yeah, it was such a bummer. There was just, again, in two weeks after doing this nine month build, we were already having mechanical issues. And we're like, oh, we just clearly have Stockholm syndrome and are just ending up in these vehicles that are just so demanding of our time and our energy. And not that there's anything wrong with that, but as people who have to rely on it to get into service, to send files for work, 
we just, we couldn't trust it. And so we just realized that we needed four by four, but we also needed trust. So we ended up, we didn't know what was next, but we just knew that over the course of that nine months, we had kind of lost touch with why we were doing what we were doing. And we just felt like we needed to refocus, recenter, and try to figure out why we were doing all of this. And so that's when we ended up in our 2008 Toyota Tacoma with just a bed cap, like just your run of the mill bed cap and a basic build in the back. Yeah, we were, we had just driven the Sun Raider up to North Carolina. So we had only made it a few states up. And that's when we made this realization. And then in North Carolina, I hopped on Craigslist and we bought a Tacoma there and then drove them both back down to Florida where we sold the Sun Raider, built a little bed platform with drawers and then left in like the course of a weekend. Yeah, seriously, we turned around. Uh, it only took about three days to sell the Sun Raider. Um, but it was really, really lovely. We had so much interest on our Sun Raider that I was able to choose who purchased it. We were able to make sure it was going to somebody who really understood what it was and that it was old and special and deserved to be cared for in the way that she deserved to be cared for. So we ensured that she went on to another family that was going to mm -hmm. care for her as much as we had. Um, but she obviously just couldn't be a part of our life going forward. Um, and then while we were in the Toyota Tacoma, we went up to Mainline Overland because we were heading up to Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and Labrador. So we stopped in uh, in Philly to chat with them, and we knew that four-wheel campers had been um, pretty high on our list. And we just loved the floor plan of the flatbed, and it felt like it was going to give us everything that we had built in the Sun Raider, but then the reliability, trust, and all of that good stuff that you get with a new vehicle. So we stopped in and had an incredible conversation with them. And we put a deposit on our build uh, the day that we took the ferry to Newfoundland. Wow. So it was like, you this, guys move fast. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, like when you know, you know, you yep. know, <laughs> like, yes, that's just, that's just what it is. And I think that again, the whole Sun Raider situation just brought everything into hyper focus. And then we realized that we were unwilling to sit still while the new build was happening. We wanted to continue to move until the day it was ready. So that's what we did. We lived in the Tacoma for nine months and we went as far north as Labrador. Um, winter set in and very early September up there and then we kind of raced our way back south. But it was an incredible time. And I will say the, that was the, uh, the Tacoma was the hardest one for us to sell because it had just like, felt like it gave us our life back. And I think that you really can't put a price on that if it felt like it had been, you know, we had yeah. just been struggling for so long. It for felt sure. like it really let us fall back in love with being on the road and yeah, just focusing on the travel itself versus the vehicle. Yeah. You guys were talking about how the vehicle basically helps you complete your why and why you do what you do. What is the why? What's the, <laughs> what's the, we're just like, <laughs> <laughs> why I, I can only, answer, I feel like you're, you should have a separate answer for this. I feel like, cause you know, <laughs> but no, but I, for me, I do this because I'm in search of inspiration for my work. I am a very creatively driven person. I feel like I'm, I'm willing to suffer for my art. I just, if, if I'm creatively fulfilled, like I feel like I'm living the life that I'm meant to, meant to be living. Um, and I am very inspired by nature wildlife and the people that we meet along the way and I feel like those things just keep me extremely hungry to keep moving. So the vehicle is like a reliable platform for you to get out into nature which yeah uh, or it's a facilitator yeah, yeah which then create which then fu fuels your creative process. Yeah 100 percent it allows us to chase what inspires us. Yeah and I think that there's you know like something to be said about constantly being not necessarily in a state of uncomfort but I feel like there's this thing in society now where everyone just is gets comfortable and they just like kind of go through cruise control through the rest of their lives. And I think that there's something to be said about being comfortable, but being uncomfortable. And so I think that that helps us be a little bit more lucid and aware of things and like just take more notice of the things around us. And I think that that's also a really big thing that drives me at least to keep traveling is we're constantly learning about ourselves and about the world around us. We're talking to people that we might never meet and 
getting influences from them, which, yeah, like greatly helps us grow as people. Yeah, I think that um, we have this or so. OK, we have actually been sitting still for the last couple of months, um, somewhat against our will. And I think that so we got on the road to come to Overland Expo um, for the first time in the last couple of months. And Owen and I on the drive over here, we took like a week to do it. And we just kept saying it felt like a part of our brain goes to sleep when we live in a home like environment. And it feels like we're waking back up, getting on the road like we're just so much more attentive. We see details in the landscape and, you know, and all sorts of things that we don't otherwise see. So it's just like this part of ourselves that goes dormant um, when we're in a comfortable, like a truly comfortable environment. And I think that we just like the people that we are um, when we're more just like aware and attuned to like what's going on around us and being on the road and this constant state of change, I think really keeps you sharp in that way. Yeah. I think too, spending that much time outside and really noticing sunrise sunset you know I would say you know whenever I'm inside I am not necessarily aware of what's going on outside yeah and so feeling the temperature and all of that really makes you feel more connected f- for sure yeah um and this is actually a, a recent realization I I've had uh while we were in Alaska this summer um I think that we all know that we like came from nature like it you know, like we know that, but I think that when you spend so much time in it, I'm starting to like feel this sense of being home, like when I'm in the outdoors more, more so than I am anywhere else. And I think it's just this connection to this, this place that we all have come from, but often feel very separated from. Like, I, I always joke that when I'm inside I and I see it's sunset outside, like I have like this weird sense of FOMO from like not <laughs> knowing what's good. Like when I, if I don't know what the moon phase is, like I'm kind of like bummed about that. And I'm not like into, what is it, astrology? Like I'm not yeah. even into astrology, but I just like to, I just like to be like in tune with what's going on in the, the natural world around me. Yeah. Um, so you guys went up to Alaska last summer? Yeah, this past summer. T- tell me more about that trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we started in Bellingham, Washington. At the time, the Canadian border was closed because of COVID, and we took the ferry up to Juneau, which was in itself one of the highlights of the trip was just that two-and-a-half-day ferry up there. We hung out in Juneau for a while, and then we ferried up to Haines and then drove all the way up to Fairbanks and then just journeyed all around the main sections of Alaska. Did our best to get out there into some pretty wild places, too. And, yeah, it was just a really interesting and, I don't know, uh, really refreshing experience for us because with COVID and borders being closed, we kind of fell into this sort of like familiar loop for a few years. And it was just nice to kind of break that cycle and see something new again and like really have that feeling of like a renewed sense of excitement. Yeah, Alaska, I feel like to a certain extent is on everybody's bucket list, but Owen and I, there we have these places that we both as kids, I think would flip through old National Geographic magazines and just like really ogle. Um, I think that the first one of those is actually the racetrack in Death Valley. And to like see that and grow up and you're like, man, this just feels like it's on another planet. And then to finally make it to that place as an adult and to like realize that you've made a bunch of decisions that have led you to this, this thing that was so inspirational to you as a kid is a really magical experience and um, getting to Alaska and to see the fishing bears in Katmai, um, which is a very, very famous waterfall where the bear, and while we were there, we saw 40 bears at any given time fishing this one waterfall. And to be able to know that you have the power to turn like childhood daydreams into a reality for yourself as an adult is like a really magical feeling. Yeah, I feel like that's, I'm like more proud of those accomplishments than like anything career wise, just being able to like make my childhood self really proud. Yeah, exactly. That's so cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's really awesome. Um, like for instance, in Alaska, I was able to surf the boar tide wave, which is this really unique wave that happens twice a day during a tidal shift. 
Um, it's just a single wave. So if you miss it, like you're out for 12 hours, like you'll have to come back and try again. Um, I ended up getting in the water with that wave six times and I only successfully stood up on the wave, I think two or three of those times. Um, but that was a wave that I learned about when I was 11 and I had wanted to surf it when I was 11. And it's so funny because I do feel like your goals change as you become an adult, but to like know that my interests have still kind of like kept this quiet burning flame inside of me. And again, these like crazy unrelated decisions that led me to the ability to get to that point, to ride the wave. And then after I did for the first time successfully ride that wave, I got out of the water and just started crying because it's just like, it's such an emotional experience to be able to like make your own dreams come true. Yeah. Completely overwhelming. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> and I will chase that feeling to the end of the earth. <laughs> this content is brought to you by Overland Journal, our premium quality print publication. The magazine was founded in 2006 with the goal of providing independent equipment and vehicle reviews, along with the most stunning adventures and photography. We care deeply about the countries and cultures we visit and share our experiences freely with our readers. We also have zero advertorial policy and do not accept any advertiser compensation for our reviews. By subscribing to Overland Journal, you're helping to support our employee-owned and veteran-owned publication. Your support also provides resources and funding for content like you are watching or listening to right now. You can subscribe directly on our website at overlandjournal.com. What other things did you guys learn from that trip about yourselves? By the way, this is the third podcast at Overland Expo where somebody's been like tearing. Oh, well, that's a, that's a good sign. I'm yeah. glad because I feel like I'm always the one who ends up crying and it's just like that crazy girl who's no, like no. super no. emotional about like the stuff that she gets to see, which, you know, is just a sign of how thankful I am for it. But yes. um, we went to Alaska uh as cheesy as this sounds with like really heavy hearts. Um, we had had three pretty major family losses um, over the course of a very small amount of time. And so I think that the both of us were kind of dealing with a, a, like a huge weight of grief that was kind of showing up in weird and unexpected ways. And Alaska and just having so much space because it really was just the two of us this summer. Um, kind of really allowed us to push through it and realize what's important to us and what we want um, out of our travels, out of our professional lives, out of our personal lives. Um, it just like gave us this, the space to process it in a way that I don't know that we would have if we were in one, a familiar place with a bunch of people. Like we would have never been able to sort through that. I'm definitely a meditate in motion kind of person and it definitely gave us the ability to sort through it all. Yeah, I think being in a sort of far-flung destination where there's not a network of people we're familiar with or supportive of us so that we are completely self-reliant for the most part and we were mostly alone. I, I can only think of one single night the entire time that we were camping with someone else over the three and a half, half months. And I think that, yeah, just having that time to ourselves to really – process things and yeah just talk about it and it was kind of therapeutic in a way just to yeah process the grief mm -hmm. and you guys were sharing that story while you were on the road by filming yeah so we filmed uh what ended up being a 15 part series <laughs> um about it the series is called lost and found I wonder what the title means. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we, we showed up in Alaska feeling really, really lost. And I think that there was a lot of guilt that came along with that because we were stressed from work, we were sad, and it just felt like maybe we weren't being as attentive to this thing that we had been looking forward to for so long. But I think that um, over the course of the time and then the additional time spent editing that series, it really gave us the opportunity to like turn all of those experiences over in our hands and uh, examine them and realize like how far we really have come um, mentally and emotionally from 
like when we first got there, just somewhere, somewhere out there in the vastness of it all, we definitely found ourselves. Was it hard to turn the camera on sometimes when yes. you were going? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. Yeah, it is. And But the thing is, I found that all of the moments that are hardest to pick up the camera for are the ones that I'm the happiest to have in, in the future. Um, because those are, those are the moments that are really transformative. Those are the ones who, that like really inform the person that you're going to be going forward. And it's really special to be able to have that to look back on. We always joke that we make these videos. They're just like glorified home videos for ourselves. <laughs> like they're not for anybody <laughs> but ourselves. Um, and I'm really, I'm really thankful to have these experiences to look back on. Yeah, it's 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 interesting too because we kind of do things a little bit differently where we we film everything for the whole three and a half months and then we go take a look at it and decide. And I think having that hindsight really helps us see like how we started versus how we ended and kind of like create this arc and figure out like the interesting points that we want to hit and like the, the moments that really like were special to us. Yeah. I think that, you know, everybody has a different process for how they create video work. Um, but I kept a journal for the entire summer, which also I feel like was a very smart idea for like remembering some of the minute details. But I think also to help me like remember some of the harder days that I feel like I have a hard time remembering if I was just going to think back on it myself. But then when we came to, um, start to like rough out the 15 episodes like Owen mentioned we're writing a, sto a story arc but like none of it is like manufactured it is what it happened uh, ha as it happened but it's just so cool to see the whole thing laid out like that and then to break it into individual episodes and the story arc that happens within those episodes and how that kind of stacks up against the overall story um, and it's kind of weird to look at your own life that way but I think I do find it to be very very cathartic um, mm -hmm. in a way. And I think that half of the personal development that has happened has been because of the editing of that series as hard and challenging as it was to make 15 episodes, just the two of us. <laughs> That's a big undertaking. It is. It won't happen again. We <laughs> must hire an editor. <laughs> How did you guys balance, uh, experiencing versus capturing? That's a great question. And it makes me happy. We've had a lot of people ask us here at Overland Expo about that process. And it makes me very happy that they're thinking about that because I think that we live in a very like binge worthy society where everybody just like wants, but they're not thinking about what's happening behind. But that is very contrary to like what people have been asking us. So it makes me really happy that people think about that. Um, for us, we're very communicative of how we're feeling and how we're doing. And we'll film some stuff and then maybe there'll be a, like four or five days where we don't film anything because we just like need to have some time to ourselves. Because if we're not having a good time, nobody who watches this series is going to have a good time. So <laughs> we just needed to make sure that we were staying in communication with one another and checked in to make sure that everybody was doing okay um, throughout the process because it's exhausting. It's a lot of work. But also that's just how we... I think that's how we experience places. I like I would have my face pressed up against a camera regardless if I was ever going to make something out of it in the end cuz that's just how we kind of process and enjoy and make art around the things that we get to see and enjoy. Yeah, I think that, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> <laughs> Can you what's your advice about creating like a narrative storytelling piece with those arcs? And if, if people want to put together their own, I guess, writing piece or a video, like what are some things you've learned along the way in terms of storytelling? Yeah. So I will say that we actually watch a lot of really incredible film breakdowns. Um, and I have no interest in writing a screenplay or ever filming a screenplay of any kind. But I think that just like learning like what a successful story looks like from a mechanical standpoint is really important to being able to like work backwards and create one out of your own story. Because like I said, we're not fabricating anything. Everything is just kind of how it happens. But the funny thing is like you have all of the pieces to write an incredible story out of your own because you have all of the information at your fingertips. But just to like know what that looks like. Um, Lessons from a Screenplay is our favorite YouTube channel that kind of breaks down 
story arcs, all sorts of different like character development ideas and things like that. And so you just have to like take that technical information and point it back at yourself and uh, be able to write a good story. But I think that having an like an overall outline for like the story that you're trying to tell, the highs, the lows, like all of the things that contribute to the development of the characters, which are ourselves. <laughs> um, but I just think it's like really important to like write it, write it all out, write an, I call it a skeleton of our series. I try to like write the skeleton out and then I fill it in with the footage that we actually have. Yeah. And I think uh, our particular style doesn't do a lot of talking head stuff. So it's mainly, it's almost like B-roll montages and then like at the end of the day Matt can kind of like go back and see how she was feeling because she writes in her journal to kind of like get those feelings and then she can write and eloquently you know describe those things and just like how we're feeling and you get to do some research and talk about the education of the area and the history and things like that that get us jazzed up I mean I don't know if everyone else is but <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think that seeing the whole seeing the whole experience through is really helpful, like because then you see the story like start to end is always going to be helpful. But much like Owen said, like looking at it as a whole and then so the vast majority of our storytelling is done through voiceover. And I again, it's just such a nice way to take it all, process it, write something eloquent, because I know what I would say in the moment would just sound completely dumb by comparison to what I could write after the fact. So that's why we tend to shy. We do shoot talking heads and sometimes we'll use snippets of them because that's like how you can work your personality into it. But I think that from the overall story, I am telling the story after the fact. Cool. Um, you guys are really passionate about, I, w I would say like tread lightly principles and leave no trace and leaving it better than you found it and conservation. Why is that so important to I, you? I was raised by a woman who ever like everywhere she went, she was like, I leave, I leave a place better than I found it. Even if that was just like a rental car, my mom was like, this will shine brighter than when we got it. And I think that she just like really instilled this idea that we have to like take care of the places that we go to. And I'm very thankful for that because it is very informative of the person that I've become. We spend 99% of our time on public land. And so our way of paying it forward, we don't pay to be there. It's like, I guess our right or whatever as Americans, like we all have access to these beautiful spaces. I want to make sure when I come back that it's going to, it's going to be there, that it's going to be taken care of, that it's in the same condition that I left it in. And I also want other people to feel the same way about it. And the thing is like, it's all about connecting with the places that we go to. And if you care about it, you're going to connect with it. And the more people that connect with these wild places, the more people that will care about them, the more people that will stand up for them, the more people that will vote for them, the more people that will ensure that these places are there in the future for us, our grandkids, everybody in the future, because we all deserve to know these places. Yeah, I think it's kind of a big conversation, but I think that one of the biggest things too is if you like going out and seeing these places, you should take care of it because if they become trash, they're going to get closed and yeah. then everyone loses. And I just, you see it happen time and time again. And the more places that close means more people are crowding up the other spots. So I just, yeah, I think it's really important to have that education out there for everyone just to help. I don't know, like for, it's for the greater good, I think. And yeah. I think that it's important for us to highlight that kind of stuff so that even if it feels like common sense to us, you know, maybe it's not for someone else. And, you know, you don't want to come across as a dick or anything like that when you're like saying these things. And I think just to do it in the most organic manner, just showing, yeah. you know, how we do it and maybe that can rub off and like a domino effect can happen. And, you know, everywhere. yeah, studies, I believe I read one study, but it <laughs> shows that if you leave your campsite clean, the next person's more likely to. I think it's it called clean. the broken window effect. Like if a house has a broken window, um, there's more likely to be more degradation done to the house because they're like, oh, clearly nobody cares about this. So 
I can do some damage to it too. So I think that we always, do, you know, we really have so little space, but I carry contractor trash bags. I use our winch gloves for picking up trash and I have like one of those cool little trash grabber things. I feel very official when I'm out there with it, <laughs> but it's, but we try to take absolutely everything humanly possible that we can out. It's not uncommon for us to end up with our entire back seat full of trash bags or our entire camper full of trash bags. And I'm filling my house with other people's trash and I'm willing to do it because I care about these places and I want to ensure that they're around for everybody. Yes. I, one conversation that was brought up at a panel here yesterday was um, the tendency to throw trash into the fire pit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's another thing to be aware of and yeah. Thank you for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I, the, the other thing is like, I can't enjoy a place until like, I can't sit back and enjoy the sunset until I've like cleaned the area. Like if there's trash, like I will not be able to sit there and enjoy myself. So it's also kind of selfish. I'm just like, <laughs> I can't, I can't, I can't sit here until this is done. Like we must put your gloves on. We got, we got work to do. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, before we wrap up, there's one question that I'm going to steal it from Scott Brady today, but he always <laughs> asks everybody in each podcast, what's your favorite book and why? I know it's so hard. I think that my favorite book that I've read, the one that jumps out immediately when you say that is the Emerald Mile, which is, <gasps> yes. have you read it? Yeah. Excellent so good. Book. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, th I thought that was just a really great story intertwining a specific narrative along with the history of an area and yeah, just a fantastic story. So for those who haven't read the Emerald Mile, it's about, oh my gosh, it's about so many things, but it's yeah. about so many history things. of the Grand Canyon and the incident where the dam broke. Yeah. It does go yeah. into part of that right. history. Yeah. They were like nailing uh, pieces of plywood on top of the dam. To try the and Hoover Dam, that. just to be clear. Uh, yes. I don't think it was. I don't think it was the Hoover Dam. Was it? it was it was the Glen, Glen Canyon. Canyon. Oh, Glen Canyon yeah. Dam. Yeah. yeah. And then this wild man gets in a boat and yeah. rides the wave. Yeah, because yeah, <laughs> they were trying they were trying to set uh, speed a speed record, record uh, paddling through the Grand Canyon. But it just is like an, this incredible like intertwined history of the Grand Canyon. The first people to like lay the first like Westerners to lay eyes on it. The native people who used to live there. Yeah. Um, it's just like so much good information about so many good things. Yeah. Mind blowing. Like Mind an blowing. incredible feat of journalism. Yes. Like, like how yeah. long do you think that took to put together? It's you know? so Gosh. funny when they would bounce between storylines. I was just like, I'm exhausted yes. for the man who wrote this. Yeah. Book. <laughs> <laughs> this is insane. Um, I think that one of my favorite books is the endurance. It's about um, the Shackleton expedition mm. that went to Antarctica. Antarctica and they, their ship ended up getting crushed by the ice and they survived out there for well over a year and they ended up making it home. It was just the most incredible survival story. Uh, Shackleton was just the most incredible leader. Uh, he kept his team together. Well, you know, he kept morale as good as you can in a situation like that, but the leadership that it took to get them out and the tenacity that those people had is just absolutely incredible. We we love we love a good adventure story. Mm -hmm. Speaking of adventure stories, what is next for you guys? What is next? We have a lot of things on the horizon for us and we're we're really excited. So, um we do have a new series that we are going to be working on this summer. We're going to be uh checking off the last of our North American bucket list items. A lot of well, the United States. Oh yeah, yeah sorry, the the United States specifically. Um, but we're going to be heading up into the northern Midwest to hit a bunch of like seldom visited national parks. Um, a lot of we're going to have some float planes, possibly some ferries, some canoes, all sorts of really cool different modes of transportation to get to these hard to access places. Lots of m multiple hundred mile hikes. We got, we got a lot going on. Exciting. Yeah. I'm, I'm really excited because it feels like that area of the country, like when people set out to travel, they always go west. And you have to like make a point to be in that particular area of the northern Midwest. And it's eluded us for far too long. And we are going to put an end to that this summer. Yes. Yeah. But other than that, I think that we're starting to uh, look ahead to international travels because it feels like the world is opening up a little bit so we can 
finally make that happen. We've only been waiting for like two and a half years. <laughs> Same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I hear you, girl. Yeah. We're going to follow great. you guys. Yeah. Yay. We're just going to, yeah. Wherever you're going, we're going. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited to follow along with your next adventures. And uh, if anybody wants to find you guys or follow your adventure or watch all your great content on YouTube or watch your adventures in Alaska via Lost and Found, where can they find you? Yeah. So we're, Bound for Nowhere in all of the places on the internet. So that's on Instagram, YouTube, our website's Bound for Nowhere. So yeah, I think if you just type in Bound for Nowhere, we should come up somewhere along the way, I think. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for spending this thank time you so with much, me. Ashley. It's thank been you. so great yeah. chatting with you and learning a little bit more about your past. And yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Happy today. to share. A lot of people helped us get to where we are. So we, we see sharing as just kind of a way of paying it forward to help other people get out there. Sharing is caring. That yes. Is, yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Cool. Well, thank you guys. And thank you to the Overland Journal podcast listeners for tuning in to another episode. Um, and we will see you next time. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Bye. Bye.